Today's video is brought to you by Policy Genius, which is helping you check something off your to-do list that you may have been putting off for a while. And that's life insurance. Look, nobody likes to think about life insurance, but the reality is that it's an important layer of protection for many families, especially for single income households. Fortunately, there's Policy Genius and their award winning policy options ranked number one by Forbes. Whether you've been putting off your purchase or you just never really thought about it, Policy Genius is the team you want to check in with. This is a third party marketplace that works for you, not for the insurance companies, so you can trust that their licensed experts are going to give you solid, unbiased advice. Life insurance premiums might seem like a financial drain, but you could save $1,300 or more per year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. If you're interested, head to policygenius.com to get started, and in a few minutes, you can work out how much coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. When you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and scheduling for free. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius and getting covered now locks in your rate. Over the course of 10 or 20 year policy, those savings really add up and best of all, eligible applicants can get covered in as little as a week. So go to policygenius.com to get started. You'll be glad you did because when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. And now today's video. The figure stood dazed and bleeding, surrounded and jostled angrily by the frenzy crowd. In a matter of minutes, this man would be dead, and the country which he had ruled for over 40 years with a bizarre mixture of terror tactics, genuinely impressive public projects, and one of the strangest cults of personality in the modern era, would begin a new chapter. The death of Muammar Gaddafi on the 20th of October 2011 in the small Libyan town of Ceuta brought an end to one of the most outlandish periods of governance in recent history. This was a man who had led Libya from 1969 until his death at the hands of rebel fighters and whose rule had seen the country lurch from Islamic socialism to state-sponsored terrorism to Western buddyism. Not technically a word, but we liked it anyway. The Libyan story over the last 60 years has been nothing short of turbulent, and sadly today it looks almost worse than ever. If you need an example of what happens when a mentally questionable man takes the reins of an oil-rich nation and allows his follies and bizarre desires to play out to their heart's content, then look no further. This is a tale of shocking repression, global terrorism, and the pursuit of nuclear and chemical weapons. But it's also one of impressive social reforms, gender equality, and huge infrastructure projects that completely changed Libya. Situated in the north of Africa on the coast, Libya has a landmass of 1.76 square kilometers, or about 680,000 square miles, making it the 16th largest country in the world. Today, it has a population of close to 7 million. It is comfortably one of the most dangerous countries in the world, but more on that a bit later. Libya's history goes way back. Tens of thousands of years ago, the area had a temperate Mediterranean climate, and instead of plenty of sand like today, the region was thick with fertile vegetation. There's evidence of people living in the coastal areas of Libya roughly 10,000 years ago, but after intense desertification sped up around 4000 BC, the population slowly dwindled. During the ancient period, the area that is today called Libya, but was then three distinct areas called Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, and Pherson, were passed between the Phoenicians and the Greeks before the arrival of the Romans in the first century BC. There they remained for over 500 years before the fall of Rome saw it become part of the first Byzantine Empire, then Arab rule under Islamic law, and finally the Ottoman Empire right up until the 18th century. Chances are that few have ever heard about the First and Second Barbary Wars, but they constitute two of the most intriguing conflicts in history that saw the United States, with the help of Sweden, or countries during the First War, declare war on a group known collectively as the Barbary States, three of which were autonomous regions of the Ottoman Empire, Tripoli, Algiers, and Tunis, and the fourth was the independent Sultanate of Morocco. Essentially, it all came down to piracy, and when the American ship Betsy was captured on the 11th of October 1784, it set up a chain of events that eventually led to war. Initially, the American government agreed to pay a ransom or a yearly tribute, depending on how you want to look at things, for the Betsy. But seven years later, shortly after Thomas Jefferson was sworn in as president, Yusuf Karamanli, the Pasha of Tripoli, demanded $225,000, around $3.5 million today, from the new administration as tribute. Understandably, Jefferson refused, and Karamanli declared war on the United 
United States. Now, what followed was fairly strange and involved a US naval blockade of Tripoli and other ports on the African coast. Two small battles proved inconclusive, but an overland invasion involving eight US Marines and 500 mercenaries made up of Greeks, Arabs, and Berbers captured the Tripolitan city of Derna. This was the first time that the US flag was raised in victory on foreign soil, and it's immortalized in the Marines' hymn with the line, To the Shores of Tripoli. This led to peace talks and eventually a treaty was signed, but it lasted less than 10 years before pretty much exactly the same row erupted again as Barbary pilots once again began attacking US ships. A small American armada was dispatched to the Mediterranean and after capturing several ships and greatly insinuating that they were willing to destroy Algiers if need be, the Barbary states once again backed down. In 1911, the area fell under Italian rule after the Italo-Turkish War, and it remained that way until the Second World War, when the area was finally conquered by the Allies in 1943. After the war, Libya was again divided, with the British controlling Tripolitania and Cyrenaica between 1943 and 1951, while the French controlled Fazan. But this was, of course, the time of independence around the world, and Libya was no different. On the 24th of December 1951, Libya declared its independence as the United Kingdom of Libya. The country was was decreed as a constitutional and hereditary monarchy under King Idris, a politician and religious leader, had long been the focal point of the Libyan independence movement. At this point, the nation had a population of around a million people and a crippled infrastructure that had been all but destroyed by the war. Libyans were among the poorest in the world at this stage of our story, with a 40% infant mortality rate and a 94% illiteracy rate. While it would have been difficult for Libya to get any worse, the country's 18 years under King Idris saw rampant corruption and favoritism exacerbate social problems. He banned political parties from operating, while also cozying up to the West, a fact that infuriated many, especially during a period of rising Arab nationalism that eventually led to the Six-Day War with Israel. Then, in 1959, oil was discovered in Libya, and it didn't take long for foreign companies to surge in and begin pumping frantically. By 1967, it was supplying a third of the oil entering the Western European market, but it's probably not a great surprise to hear that murky outside forces had begun to pressure the king and his government over reforms and control of the oil fields. Of all the coups that have popped up around the world, this one was the one that many could see coming. Libya, while much better off than just a couple of decades before, remained a relatively poor nation that was effectively being drained of its natural resources without the people really getting a decent slice of the pie. On the 1st of September 1969, a group of about 70 young army officers known as the Free Officers Movement was led by 27-year-old Captain Gaddafi, a man from humble beginnings in Western Libya, who had somehow managed to not only rise quickly through the military ranks, but also to place himself as the leader of this would-be revolution. They launched a coup d'etat when King Idris was in Turkey for a medical procedure. It shows the level of resentment that had grown under the king's rule because the coup was carried out relatively smoothly and with little to no bloodshed. Rule was officially placed in the hands of the Revolutionary Command Council, RCC, a 12-man group, and almost immediately the nation was renamed the Libyan Arab Republic, while Gaddafi was promoted to colonel and appointed as commander-in-chief of the Libyan Armed Forces. Before we go any further, it's probably worth focusing our attention a little on the main character of the story here, Muammar Muhammad Abu Minyar al-Gaddafi. Born sometime in 1942, and yeah, that's the best we can do, near Kusar Abu Hari, a rural area outside the town of Sirte, the young Gaddafi came into a situation that couldn't really be any further from his glittering heyday. The term rags to riches is often overused, but in this case, it's absolutely perfect. His father was a goat and camel herder, and the family eked out a difficult existence at a time of deep insecurity as a distant European war came to the deserts of Western Libya. His early education came in Sirte, and the young boy would sleep in a mosque during the week before walking the 32 kilometers, that's 20 miles back to his parents' house every weekend. As he progressed through his teenage years to adulthood, he became increasingly politicized and retained deep admiration for Egyptian President Nasser, who he saw as a shining Arab beacon 
in the face of imperialism. After deciding that studying history at Benghazi University wasn't quite for him, he dropped out and joined the military in 1963, and the following year he established the Central Committee of the Free Officers Movement, a group that would eventually topple the monarchy, but started out as a small, revolutionary-minded faction who the authorities paid little to no attention to. Shortly after graduating in August 1965, he became a communications officer in the Army's Signal Corps and traveled to the UK the following year to complete an English-language course at Beaconsfield, Buckinghamshire, an Army Air Corps Signals Instructors course at Bovington Camp Dorset, and an Infantry Signals Instructors course at Hythe in Kent. Despite openly stating his disdain for the British and any imperialist nation, Gaddafi was hugely impressed with Britain, especially compared to what remained back in Libya. And when he returned in 1967, he did so with renewed vigor for change. As the dust settled over the 1st of September coup, Gaddafi and others in the RCC sought to assert their control over this new young nation that had emerged. Another attempted coup, let's say a coup within a coup, was prevented in December 1969. The resulting reorganization saw Gaddafi add the roles of Prime Minister and Defense Minister to his blossoming portfolio. If there was any doubt over where the real power lay within Libya, well, now it was quickly being answered. Part of this clearinghouse involved the trials of more than 200 former government officials, including the king and his family, as well as seven former prime ministers and numerous cabinet ministers who were charged with treason and corruption by the Libyan People's Court, an emergency tribunal set up purposefully for this reason. The king himself was found guilty in absentia and sentenced to death, with four more death sentences and countless prison sentences handed down. In 1971, the Free Officers Movement was renamed the Arab Socialist Union, or ASU, and quickly the muzzle of repression descended as strikes and demonstrations were banned, the media conscripted under governmental control, and foreign nationals, many of whom were either Jewish or of Italian descent, were expelled from the country. And so began the age of Gaddafi, and, well, what a bumpy, wacky, up-and-down ride it would be. So let's start out with his ideologies, which seem to come and go with the seasons. In 1975, Gaddafi published his Green Book, in which he outlined his political philosophy, which mainly came across as jumbled ravings on socialist utopias. In it, he claimed to have found the happy marriage between capitalism and communism, but its implementation in Libya was, well, patchy at best. Part of this was a cultural revolution that swept through the country in the early years after the coup, which was designed to create bureaucratic efficiency efficiency, public interest, and participation in the sub-national governmental system and national political coordination. Gaddafi openly encouraged his citizens to rise up and take control of government organizations by creating committees at different levels of society. And if this is starting to sound a little bit like the Soviet Union, well, yeah, kind of. But, well, no socialist nation in the world was ever quite like Libya. With this revolutionary zeal came some real economic progress, and Libya's five-year economic and social transformation plan was announced in 1975, and it was designed to pump $20 billion into the economy to try and diversify away from the country's huge reliance on oil. The great man-made river may come with a slightly pompous name, but as the world's largest irrigation project that brings 6.5 million cubic kilometers of fresh water per day to the cities of Tripoli, Benghazi, Serta, and others from roughly 1,300 wells further south, it almost deserves it. Enormous economic and infrastructure progress was certainly made under Gaddafi, and this was joined by some genuine social strides forward. The previous regime had placed severe restrictions on women, and this this was one area that saw significant change. In 1970, a law was introduced affirming equality of the sexes and insisting on wage priority, and in 1972, a law was passed criminalizing the marriage of any females under the age of 16 and ensuring that a woman's consent was a necessary prerequisite for marriage. Now, that might not sound too extraordinary, but do remember this was an Arab nation in the 1970s, and it would be decades until neighboring countries caught up. And, well, some still haven't. As we're about to come to, Gaddafi got involved in plenty of heinous actions around the world that led to the deaths of thousands of people. But it is important to be clear about what he did for the people of Libya. He was certainly no saint, and many hated his quasi-Soviet come Arab revolution. But he was also not simply a tyrannical dictator who destroyed the country. And before we move on, 
Let's just touch on some of the more bizarre aspects of Gaddafi. There were the well-known Amazons, a group of 40 female bodyguards who reportedly kept watch over him, complete with pristine makeup and high heels. He was said to have had quite an infatuation for ex-Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, so much so that a creepy photo album made up entirely of pictures of her was found in one of his homes. Oh, and despite his progress with female equality, he was an absolute sexual deviant who apparently even had a secret signal when meeting people that showed his entourage that this woman should be escorted back to his personal boudoir and, well, we're sure you can imagine what happened from there. Now, it's no exaggeration to say that we could probably do an entire video on Libyan involvement in terrorist activities and international military movements. Say what you like about Gaddafi. The man had a vision of a global uprising against imperialism that he did his utmost to put into practice. While some cases were aligned with his own ramblings in the Green Book, others had little to do with his ideas, and at times it seemed like Gaddafi simply threw his support by any resistance group going at the time. Just let me rattle off a few of the big hitters that Libya got involved with around the world. The Black September Movement, responsible for the Munich Massacre at the 1972 Summer Olympics, the Provisional IRA, the Mara Islamic Liberation Front in the Philippines, the Palestine Liberation Organization, FARC in Colombia, the Sandistas in Nicaragua, with the Red Army Faction in West Germany, the Red Brigades in Italy, and there were even reports of Libyan agents attempting to stir up a Maori uprising in New Zealand and an Aboriginal revolt in Australia. With most of these, it's not entirely clear how far support went, and whether it was financially, militarily, in the form of weapons, or whether it was simply vocal support. Although, when he publicly said, the bombs which are convulsing Britain and breaking its spirit are the bombs of Libyan people. We have sent them to Irish revolutionaries so that the British will pay the price for their past deeds. Well, saying that, he made it pretty clear what was going on. But by that point, an Irish Coast Guard ship had already intercepted a boat carrying Soviet-made arms from Libya, destined for the provisional IRA, so people knew what was going on. Gaddafi also did his utmost to get his hands on nuclear weapons, but while the Libyan program huffed and puffed, it never really materialized. The Soviet Union helped construct a 10-megawatt research reactor at Tajura, which was opened in 1981, but Gaddafi repeatedly failed to convince outside nations to assist with his program, with First the Chinese and then the Pakistanis rebuffing his advances. He had much more luck with chemical weapons, and while the total amount that Libya amassed is up for debate, in 2004 when the country signed up to the Chemical Weapons Convention, it declared 24.7 metric tons of mustard gas, 1,390 tons of chemical precursors for making sarin, as well as 3,563 unloaded chemical weapon munitions to be used as aerial bombs. Now, while the world may have grudgingly tolerated Gaddafi's flirtations with resistance movements around the globe, the jump to state-sponsored terrorism was quite a different matter. The bombing of the Lebel Club in Berlin on April 5, 1986, which killed three and injured 229, was suspected to be Libyans at the time, but was only confirmed after the reunification of Germany. However, it was another attack that focused the world's attention on Libya. On the 21st of December 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 was traveling from Frankfurt to Detroit via a stopover in London. After refueling in the English capital, it flew north and was above the Scottish town of Lockerbie when a bomb planted before takeoff detonated, tearing the plane apart and sending debris crashing down on Lockerbie. The attack killed 270 people, including 11 on the ground, and it remains the worst terrorist attack on British soil. After a three year investigation involving multiple agencies across the world, arrest warrants were issued for two Libyan nationals in November 1991. Gaddafi refused to extradite the two men, we wonder why, and the following year, sanctions were placed on Libya that would slowly choke the life out of the country. With the global community rallying together, the economic punishment placed upon Libya was swift. UN sanctions cut airline connections with the outer world, they reduced diplomatic representation and prohibited the sale of military equipment, while Libya's foreign assets were frozen and the sale of refinery or pipeline equipment to Libya was banned. The country suffered an estimated $900 million, that's $1.6 billion today, financial loss as a result of the sanctions that dragged on through the 1990s until Libya agreed to hand over Abdul Basset al Megrahi and Lamin Khalifa Fima to the court in Holland to be tried for their parts in the Lockerbie bombing. Al Megrahi was convicted of the murder of 270 people, while Fima was acquitted 
on all charges. But there was one final step that the UN demanded before Libya could be fully welcomed back into the international fold. And in 2003, the country paid $2.7 billion, around $4 billion today, to the families of those killed in the bombing, though Gaddafi always strenuously denied any knowledge of the attack. With Libya now a fully settled up member of the global community, Gaddafi experienced something of a renaissance as he was openly courted by numerous European governments, the Chinese and the Russians, as well as the Americans. Suddenly, everybody's favorite moderate to very crazy dictator was being pictured with the real movers and shakers of the global community, and it was as if all those terrorist misdemeanors had just never happened. Suddenly, foreign money was pouring into Libya, and those ideas of socialism and nationalism that Gaddafi had based so much of his early energies on all but disappeared. Gradually, the country was becoming an autocratic desert democracy, minus any elections, of course, with more money than it knew what to do with. In many ways, Gaddafi had performed a quite extraordinary 180, and in 2010, plans were announced that would have effectively privatized half of the nation's economy over the following decade. While the move proved deeply unpopular, it wasn't all bad news for the people, with price controls and subsidies over oil and food remaining in place, along with state-provided benefits such as free education, universal healthcare, free housing, free water, and free electricity. But it was events that began outside Libya that would eventually lead Lead to Gaddafi's downfall. When the Arab Spring erupted in 2011, many of the region's long-lasting leaders feared for the future. As huge protests ripped through the Arab world, Tunisia's President Zini al abidine Ben Ali, Egypt's President Honzi Mubarak, and Yemen's President Ali Abdullah Saleh were all forced from power. Not exactly always peacefully, but they were in stark contrast to what would happen in Libya. Protests began in February 2011 and quickly gathered steam, and the country collapsed into civil war with the National Transitional Council of Libya declaring itself as the legitimate government and calling on the international community for support. But considering what happened in nearby Syria, where a 10-year civil war is still ongoing, the fall of Gaddafi and his regime came swiftly, greatly aided when the UN implemented a no-fly zone in March 2011. This UN mandate began as a way of protecting civilians, but quickly escalated into attacks on government forces themselves. In August 2011, the final battle for Tripoli began and lasted barely a week. On the 16th of September 2011, the National Transitional Council was recognized by the United Nations as the legal representative of Libya, and as the rebels fanned out across Libya, the hunt for Gaddafi was on. There was significant confusion over the whereabouts of Gaddafi as the war began to wind down. Many assumed he had fled the country, either going west or south, but there was always an inkling that he may be hiding near Sarte, close to where he was born and one of the few areas still loyal to him. The final hours of his life are far from clear. It's thought that he may have been part of a convoy attempting to flee Serta that was attacked by foreign aircraft. What we know is that Gaddafi was found badly injured, hiding in a disused water pipe and dragged out by the rebels. Much of his final moments were recorded and quickly found their way onto the internet, though the exact circumstances of how he died remain unclear. His lifeless body was later shown lying in an ambulance and later that day, Libyans were informed of his death. Sadly, we're becoming accustomed to nations that were once under heavy-handed dictators collapsing into civil war once that ruler is removed, and Libya has been a perfect example. Ten years on, Libya is still a complete mess that is being pulled apart by two competing governments who both claim complete authority and legitimacy. The country also became a focal point for ISIS and other extremist movements, but with Western nations recoiling at the idea of another military adventure in the Middle East, the Libyans have pretty much been left to their own devices. Few countries around the world have a story quite like Libya's a rise from one of the poorest countries in the world after World War II to a solid middle-class ranking nation in terms of development and spending via a lengthy stay on the terror watch list thanks to their leader's ravenous appetite for revolution. Sadly, Libya seems to be staggering backwards right now. Gaddafi may be long gone, but for this beleaguered nation on the African shores of the Mediterranean, there seems to be no end in sight to this frantic roller coaster experience.